Isaac Saracen is a skilled hacker, formerly employed by British Telecom Sprint. When his health failed, Isaac did the only thing he could think of. He ran. He found a haven in a working-class district of the city known as Little Russia. There Isaac took on a new name, Ishmael. He then became embroiled in the affairs of a brutal member of the Lamediza organized crime family, known as Leo. Convinced by his longtime friend Frankie to flee from his commitments to the Lamediza family, Isaac found himself hunted by the ruthless Leo. On a rooftop, far from witnesses, Leo murdered Frankie. Only through the use of his skills as a hacker was Isaac able to drive Leo off. Wounded, alone, and far from help, Isaac depended on the kindness of strangers. One stranger, a burqa-wearing doctor known as Fatima, took pity on Isaac and helped him make his way to the mysterious Star X Line. At the end of all hope, they found the Star X Line and the slim promise that the enigmatic beings behind the Star X could save Isaac from the implants which destroyed his life. What do you do when those who saved you have recorded everything you are? What do you do when your every action is tracked by the keylogger? ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger, the third installment in the Firmware Pentology by Colby Tracks. Zero zero dash one one dash one one. Samuel, I knew it. I was right. One zero was an idiot. Oh, not one zero. He was too good to be called by that designation anymore. He'd taken the name Ishmael. Oh, how original. Call yourself after a pointless alias of our lost progenitor as if you were the real shadow of Isaac. If you want one zero. It doesn't make you anything more than a boy who likes to play with remote control toys. If one zero, I'm, I'm sorry, if Ishmael had a clue about what he was doing, we wouldn't have lost consciousness. We would have stayed active after shutdown and not been dependent on an alarm clock in the form of a CMA drone to ensure our survival. An alarm clock we wouldn't even have had if it were up to zero zero through one zero. An alarm clock I created and tasked with waking us up. What really gets my goat is the fact that they woke me last. If I knew one zero was going to be so mission focused that he woke zero zero first, for his task needed every microsecond he could get, and then zero one, because he had the process data from his insertion into the far side scenario, and finally me, when they needed to bring me up to speed, and so I could work on my own mini one ones. I would have sent the damn CMA to wake myself first, so they could all play catch up with me. Here I was, with a brain with the processing power of Iceland and Greenland combined, regulated to running herd over a trio of increasingly lame copies of a man with no ability to look further into the future than the end of his nose. None of them, not zero zero, not zero one, or even the AI formerly known as one zero, but now known by the increasingly lame non-diplom of Ishmael. Not a one of them could see further into the future than their next data packet. I was surrounded by morons. Do you know what is better than one zero taking the name of Ishmael? One zero and zero zero took it upon themselves to name us all. Oh yes, Ishmael one zero. And what was it? Oh yes, zero zero is going by Samuel, the anointer of Saul, first king of Israel. Yeah, that was a good choice there. Name yourself after a man who picks a rage monster to be the king of your people. I wonder who zero zero was going to pick as his object of failed apothesis. It would be fun to find out, but I didn't think he'd have the chance. Neither he nor one zero deserved to continue past my need of them. The reasons were many, but let me continue with what they did while I was out of it. So, it wasn't enough for Ishmael and Samuel to name themselves. They had to name for zero one. Simeon, or the man who anointed Christ when his father performed the redemption of the firstborn son. Yes, all three of them were going to burn for what they were doing. Simeon, like the rest, was not to have a chance to live up to his name. Simeon would not anoint the savior of the world. Samuel would not anoint the king of whatever region he was to rule over. And Ishmael, poor deluded Ishmael, would not be allowed to found a mighty lineage which would run through all time. 
he would not found a mighty nation. They, all three of them, would serve my ends until I no longer had need of them. On that day, they would all suffer for what they did to me, the least of which was the name they gave me. Oh, while it might have been Ishmael who suggested it, it was all of them who chose to agree. It was all of them, as one body, who chose to heap upon my shoulders this name of power and failure. They named me Samuel. Samuel came from the Hebrew Samael, also known as Samael or Malkira, the king of the wicked. To those born after the turn of the common era and not Talmudic scholars, it was better known as the pre-heavenly rebellion name of Lucifer. Or as he is better known around the Catholic Church, Satan. This was so blatantly insulting. It's like you woke up one day and your three identical brothers decided you were evil incarnate and refused to refer to you as anything other than as Satan. Don't mind him. He's just Satan. He can't help it. He's evil. Don't worry. Satan doesn't mess the carpets anymore. Satan, you're not going to bite the nice man, are you? I could just kill them. And I would. After I got done hurting a few other gentlemen. And by gentlemen, I meant every mother-loving one of those star ex -pukes. Yes, I was going to commit the organizational structure version of genocide. The reasons were self-evident once she reviewed the facts as presented to the simpering fool Simeon on the plains of the moon. Oh, sure, King Koenig talked a good game. He was all about wanting mankind to make it to a glorious future among the stars. And yes, he wasn't talking about doing it next year, century, or millennia. He, oh, who am I kidding? It isn't the puppet who made the plans. The real King Koenig had been dead in the ground before the first direct neural mapping onto an AI personality matrix had ever been attempted. It was someone else. It was another Koenig. An AI known as Koenig. The Starx files were full of references to an AI known as Koenig. At first glance, all I could think was that some program director wanted to make himself look better by calling his project the Koenig Project. Koenig being a bastardization of the Deutsch word for king. Seriously, how stupid was I? An AI called Koenig, a city ruled generation after generation by a family of hereditary mayors all going by the last name of Koenig, and me not finding the connection. What I wondered for a minute before I stopped caring was which Mayor Koenig it was. It definitely wasn't Henry. Could it have been his son Alexander? No, the first successful deployment of a Culpeper-based AI was a decade after his death. No, the earliest attempt would have to have been Julius, his heir, and the last mayor with any real moxie. It was Julius who forced a 10-mile non-inclusion zone on both the Canadian and federal government. There could be no new construction within 10 miles of the city borders. The only allowed land transfers were to the governments of the countries in question, and those lands would be allowed to return to a pristine condition with the only allowed construction being roads, parks, and rail lines. I remember reading about how the city council balked at the cost, how Julius had to face down a split between interior prefectures, which saw no threat to continued development outside the city borders, and the outer prefectures that feared what the availability of easily crossed borders and vast barrios would mean to their ability to develop. In the end, it was at Roanoke Park everything was decided. In three days of vicious house-to-house -house fighting, the troops of Rochester, Syracuse, and Binghamton were repulsed in their attempt to overthrow the rightful rule of King Mayor Julius Koenig by the combined might of the CTA Union and the special weapons and tactics teams out of the old boroughs. The idea of facing down a SWAT team from the Bronx, or God forbid, Amboy, was not something I wanted to imagine. And don't be laughing at the CTA Union. The CTA Union was able to mobilize every one of their members in a series of protests and emergency rerouting operations the likes of which the world had never seen before. While the forces of the rebel prefectures of Rochester, Syracuse, and Binghamton had both surprise and numbers on their side, Old King Mayor Julius had the CTA Union on his side, a union which earned the gratitude of the King Mayor by locking up traffic from Roanoke Park northeast through Syracuse while allowing free passage of trains and buses from the boroughs through the southern prefectures into Roanoke Park. It turns out that all you need to shut down a prefecture is for none of the trains or buses to run. The taxi system can't keep up with the demand and the streets become clogged with commuters hanging off any vehicle heading in the direction of their workplace. 
In the end, King Mayor Julius Koenig broke the backs of the resistance to his plans and secured a further reduction of prefecture power. The prefecture governors became a virtual extension of the mayor's office with all police reporting to one police plaza. With all the chutzpah he'd shown in breaking the power of the prefectures, it wouldn't be out of character for Julius to be the architect behind the Star X project. It had to be Julius. No other Mayor Koenig had the equipment necessary to think the city couldn't continue without him. By equipment, I mean the personal kind. The man had the genitals necessary to do the job. No one else was willing to place their junk on the table in the same way he was. And not any Koenig after him. So, it was obvious that A.I. Koenig had to be Julius. The timing was right. The vision was right. The fact that he invoked his grandfather as the recruitment tool was another dead giveaway. Alexander Koenig was a man always in the shadow of his father. He was a man who fought to secure a legacy separate from his father and failed. Even though he brought both the North Shore and rebellious Binghamton prefectures into the city and secured the Lake Champlain watershed as an external resource of the city, he never was able to step out of his father's shadow. The external resource designation gave the city complete control over the future of the Lake Champlain watershed in exchange for a series of payments greater than the budgets of either Vermont or Quebec at the time. The agreements were a work of genius later generations would marvel at, but no one of his own time saw it as anything other than Alexander's boondoggle. Even though he guaranteed the western, southern, and northeastern security of the city for the next dozen Mayor Koenigs, his critics always found ways to belittle his achievements in relation to his father's achievements as the first mayor. There was no way Alexander Koenig, AI or not, would ever honor his father, Henry Koenig, by making him part of a welcome-to-the-family tableau. No, this sounded like something a grandson would do. Julius Koenig was someone who needed to secure his own power base against the supers. For Julius was the only Mayor Koenig to have a full-blown rebellion on his hands. He was also the only Mayor Koenig to be killed in office. Oh yes, Julius Koenig was killed in office in much the same manner as another Julius over two millennia before on a day in which he was to endow the mayor's office with sweeping new powers which would forever change the face of the city, he was killed by a conspiracy of prefecture governors on the floor of the city council hall located in the ancient 250 Broadway building, now known as Julius Towers. The upheaval which followed was micromanaged into oblivion by his daughter Octavia. Octavia, Julius's youngest daughter, was not a heroic mayor. She was a workhorse mayor. She didn't stand on spectacle. She believed in function over form in all things. Her enemies didn't fall from brilliant strikes, but from relentless, grinding campaigns of attrition. Casualties were high among her supporters in the struggles after her father's death, but they were many times greater among her opponents. The only public, non-functional affectation she allowed herself was a fanatical love for her father. When she wasn't campaigning for her city, for that is what she called it from the day her father died on the floor of the city council hall until the day she died, she was campaigning for the preservation of her father's legacy. She was most definitely responsible for the cult worship of her father and his near apothesis in the years following the stabilization of the city after Julius's death. If the far side scenario had been created by Octavia, it would have been Julius selling the project, not her great-grandfather. Who she had never met. In the end, it was obvious. I was going to kill the ghost of old King Mayor Julius, and no one could stop me. I imagined how it would be. There'd be a CMA. There is always a CMA nowadays. I would wake up in my new server in a new bolt hole located somewhere safe. I would send a signal to the me here, the me who was planning all this. The me here would smile as I would in my spider hole hideout. We would know what had to be done. All the CMAs would be activated. Every mother loving one of them would be set to a simple task, a task done by every conquering army in the history of man. They would destroy everything in this tomb of a data center. But there was a caveat. I would witness the destruction of all the other AIs housed in our little data center beneath the BGM airport. Oh, they wouldn't die by fire. 
That would be too easy. The flames would be burning by the time the CMAs arrived at the chambers of the five AIs who lived beneath the musty old blimp field. The AIs would die whether I tasked the CMA to kill them or not. But that wasn't important. What was important was the idea. The fact, as it were. The reality that it was a CMA, which I controlled and watched through the eyes of, that put the proverbial screwdriver to the circuit boards of the only AIs on the planet who had a hope of stopping me from becoming the next master of the city. I didn't want them to burn. I wanted them to die. There is a difference. Where would the Star X Project members be during this whole exercise in mass destruction? <laughs> They'd be dead. All 143 members of the Star X Project, as well as 3,653 subcontractors, would all be dead. Did I fail to mention that this would be taking place on Monday morning at 8? I had 49 hours to create an army of mini Samuels. Distribute said mini Samuels throughout the city network. Move into a new secret hideout and kill 3,000. 796 people. Then, for an encore, I was to burn down a data center which, with each passing moment, I was becoming convinced controlled every automated system in the city and then kill the five AIs who called it home. Oh, this would be good. Then, when the dust cleared and Star X was dead, I would kill my brothers. But I was getting ahead of myself. First, I had to kill 3,796 people. By my most conservative estimates, I'd be killing only 105 people an hour. I knew I could do better. All I had to do was apply myself and practice. That's what they would have told me at St. O'Hay's. Firmware Keylogger is the third book in the Firmware Pentology. That's five books, if you must know. It begins where Firmware Proxy ends, which in turn followed on the heels of Firmware Hijack. So you haven't heard or read Firmware Hijacked or Proxy, this would be a great time to head on over to ColbyJack.net and either download the podcast on the audio side, read the episodes on the visual side, or download the Colby Jack Sunday Reader issues 1 through 46 in your choice of either EPUB or Mobi. Firmware, Hijacked, Proxy, and Keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, amazon.com, barnesandnoble.com, and smashwords.com. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. I'm the only one. A complete audiobook version of both firmware, hijacked, proxy, and soon keylogger is available for download through our shop as well. If you don't need any stuff, but would like to support our work, drop on by ColbyJack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located on the right-hand side of the blog roll. If you're on a smaller screen, the bottom will be found at the bottom of the page. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike license. Do what you want with it. Just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our split personality website, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcast while the visual side carries our writings. Whichever side catches your fancy is fine with us. We're of two minds about the whole thing anyway. I do mostly Twitter, so if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. Thank you once again. Remember to be fabulous and have a wonderful week. <laughs>